Well, good afternoon, everybody. Or is it still morning? I don't know what time it is. How's everybody feeling today? Everybody doing all right? Does anybody in the house love Jesus? I believe you. I believe you. It is such an honor and a privilege to worship with you today. And uh, if I have not met you, my name is Bernard, and I have the privilege of serving on this team here at Bayside as the campus pastor here at Lakewood Ranch. And so thankful to be with you. Lakewood Ranch, can you put your hands together for everybody that's joining us online? All of our families, thank you. Last week was Easter, had a great time, it was amazing. It was a great, great attendance, great show up. But I'm thankful that um, Jesus died for us. He rose again, and now we get to have that life. And this week, I have the privilege of kicking off a new series. And uh, the series that we're going to do for the next couple of weeks is called Ancient Kings. All right? So we're going to be studying some of the ancient kings. There's lessons to be learned from some of these kings that led Israel. And uh, I thought this week, I would kick off with King David. Now, David is one of my favorites uh, in the scripture, and uh, we're going to talk about today King David. There's some great things about David all throughout scripture. David is mentioned more in the Bible than all the other characters outside of Jesus. So the closest runner-up is Abraham. Abraham uh, has 14 chapters that mention his name, including the New Testament. And then after Abraham, there's Joseph, who's mentioned also in 14 chapters, uh, including the New Testament. And then there's Elijah. And uh, he's mentioned in 10 chapters dedicated to him, also mentioned in the New Testament. But our boy David, 66 books of the Bible mention his name, and his name is mentioned 59 times in the New Testament alone. How many know there's some significance to that dude, David, right? Most of you, he's famous for when he slayed Goliath, right? Uh, When he slayed Goliath, that was one of the big stories about David. But there's so many things about his life that we can learn. I don't have time to do all of that, but there's some things about his life that I highlighted today. We're going to spend primarily most of our time in 1 Samuel, but there's three books in particular in this story that I'm going to tell has different versions of it in three different books. But I'm going to focus on 1 Samuel And I just want to kind of give you an idea of what was happening. Now, first of all, as we set up this to talk about ancient kings, you first need to know that it was never God's intent that Israel be led by a king. He wanted to be the king. And he was the king. And he did miraculous things for them. He led them. He, I mean, he provided for them. But it came a time when the Israelites were not satisfied and they wanted to look like the other nations. So they asked Samuel, who was a judge, he was a prophet, and he was a judge. So the, the, the people of Israel, they were led by judges because God was the king. And so they went to Samuel, who was a judge, but he was a prophet, and they said, hey, we want God to give us a king like all the other nations. Can you ask him to give us a king? And so Samuel couldn't believe what they were asking, and so he goes before the Lord, and the Lord tells him, you know what? They're rejecting me. Give them what they want. Go ahead, to, to give, give them a king. Now, it's a scary thing when you get what you want from God. When he's like, go ahead, just give them what they want. But when he said, give them what they want, he says, but warn them with the choice that they're, getting, that they're making right now. This is what's going to happen when they are led by kings. And he goes on to describe all of the, the, the struggle that they were going to have being led by kings. And if you read the, the Bible and you read the, the, the Old Testament, you begin to see how every king that led them had some issues. <laughs> and they started to have some trouble after trouble after trouble. As they did whatever God said, that's what happened. And so that's because they chose, instead of, they had the real king, but instead of being satisfied with the real king, they chose to go with a fake one. Now, what's interesting is you go from having God as your king, perfect to now asking to be like everybody else. All the other nations got a king. We want a king. How many know humans are imperfect? When you you put humans in the mix, it's going to get messy. And that's exactly what happened. It got messy. Now, there was a king before David. The first king of Israel was named Saul. Now, Saul was something else. And he was tough. He was a tough one. And he was, before uh, David came on the scene, Saul was, was king for like 25 years. 
And David comes on the scene, but how he comes on the scene is very interesting because while Saul was reigning, what ended up happening is Saul began to displease God. And so God said, man, this joker, let me tell you, we got, we got to put somebody else in charge. So he tells Samuel, I want you to go find another king. And so Samuel goes and he comes to this family, he comes to Jesse. Now, Jesse is David's father. David has seven other brothers, so he's one of eight. David was a shepherd, we know that. Uh, David is um, known for writing uh, several of the books in the book of Psalms. In fact, out of the 150 uh, chapters in Psalms, these books, David is credited with writing 73 of them. A lot of them he wrote, they were songs that he wrote while he was in distress running from the dude, the king that was trying to kill him. Uh, it's very interesting. There's lots of praise in songs, but there's also lots of heartbreak where, where he's, you know, he's writing. Now, David was, I mean, he was a musician, all kinds of things. And, and so, of course, being a shepherd, he learned how to protect the sheep. He was doing all this um, faithful in all of those things. But while he's out there one day, Samuel, now looking for a, a king, he comes to Jesse and he says, do you have sons? He says, yes. He calls his sons except for David. So seven sons come. And they walk before Samuel. And Samuel looks and he's like, surely that's the one. And none of them were the one that God chose. So Samuel asks Jesse, he says, now, is this all the sons you have? And Jesse's like, well, there's one more. He's out in the field watching sheep. He's like, well, go get him. We won't eat until he comes. So they go get David. David comes, Samuel looks, and immediately there's a confirmation. That's the one. God's, that's the one that God chose to be the next king of Israel. So Samuel anoints him with, with oil. Some scholars say that he whispered at that time in, in David's ear that he would be the next king of Israel. And so, of course, there was a process because after that anointing, David goes back into the field and begins to be a shepherd, continue to be a shepherd, being faithful doing that. But he just was anointed to be king of Israel. But somebody else was sitting in that seat. So then uh, Saul, Saul is, um, he's making some bad decisions, some bad choices. And so now he's being tormented. He's all depressed. He's got a funky spirit. He got an attitude. He, I mean, he tripping. And so he's like, oh man, they, they, they're trying to get his soul at rest. So they, they ask um, his servant to find somebody that can just bring some, some peace to his mind. So his servant says, oh, well, Jesse has this one son and he's an incredible harpist and he's good looking and he makes good judgment. He's a warrior, all this. And so they say, oh, go get him. And so David comes and he begins to play the harp to kind of soothe Dave, uh, Saul when Saul got crazy. But then Saul gets all jealous and upset with David and he throws a spear at him. He's trying to kill him. Now, this is the king trying to kill the future king, but he doesn't know it's the future king because when David got anointed, uh, the spirit of God, the word says the spirit of God left Saul and came upon David because God made a decision. If you don't do it God's way, you better be careful. Can I just say that again? If you don't do it God's way, you got to be careful. <clears throat> All right. So when you began to look at the story, now I think about it and I'm just, I'm blown away because God wanted to be the king of Israel. But the children of Israel didn't want him to be king anymore, even though, now just think about this, every, all of the deliverance, just coming out of Egypt and parting the Red Sea and, and providing food for them, all of that, and they still said, God's not enough, not good enough for us. You know why? They decided to look at everybody else and said, I want to be like everybody else. It reminds me of what's happening in our world today. Through social media and all these other things, people look at people's lives and go, I want that, I want that. And you forget all the blessings that you have in your own life. And you think that if I can have that, then I'll be something. And if I can have that, I can be something. No, you just be content with where you're at because you're blessed. So we go into this. We want a fake king. We don't want the real one. We, we want the fake. It reminds me of a show that I, I like on... Uh, TV, it's, it's, it's called Cake or Fake. Anybody ever seen that? Uh-huh. Cake or Fake. My God. So, I'm going to ask you a question. Now, everybody in here and that's watching online as well, I'm going to ask you to participate. All right? I'm going to ask you a question. I just want you to lift your hand. If you think this is real, lift your hand. 
okay? If you think this is real, lift your hand. Okay, all right, one more time. Real? All right, real. Okay, there's only one way to find out. It's only one way to find out. Real? Lift your hand again if you set call this real. All right. One way to find out. Real? <laughs> Woo! Now, well, since I done cut it, I might as well. I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, Jesus. I should, right? I just should just, mm. I'll be right back. Excuse me, y'all. Mm. Mm. So often in our world today, and this is why this is really important, through social media and all these things, they're trying to tell you what's real, but it's really a counterfeit for the real thing. And if you do not have the spirit of God in you that gives you the discerning of spirits to know what you're facing, you're going to settle for the counterfeit rather than what was real. You cannot play in this world in life. You can't play this game of life with the fake. This wouldn't even last a, a down in football. Well, they go from throwing it to eating it. It'll turn into something else. The king, the children of Israel... They gave up a king for a fake king. And so often in this world, I'm telling you, we're faced with choices every day. And in these choices, this, this main choice that we're faced with is will I allow God to be my king? Or will I allow the image of something else to be my king? And when you start to allow the image of something else, you reap the consequences of that something else. Now, I can, I can go ahead and enjoy this, but I can only enjoy it for a moment because there's consequences. If I sat here and ate all this, it'd be like, I mean, there's going to be a consequence. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Some people are like, what did he just do? Well, for those young people that don't know, Fat Albert back in the day, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right, right. There's a consequence. For choosing what's fake. Somebody's like, oh, I used to love that cartoon, Saturday morning, baby. But in 1 Samuel 8, this is what they did. They were like, no, we want a king. We, we want a king. And this was so scary because God says this in 1 Samuel 8, verse 7. He says, do everything they say to you, the Lord replied. He's speaking to Samuel. He says, for they are rejecting me, not you. And he says, they don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and, and followed other gods. And now they are giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask and solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. Israel forgotten all the miraculous ways that God had delivered them and fought for them. And God had intentionally set them apart, but they wanted to be like everybody else. God gave them the worst judgment that they could have gotten by giving them what they wanted. Now, here's what's interesting. Samuel's is, he was torn about this and the, these elders of Israel, they're still like, man, we, we just want a king. We really want to be like everybody else. Now, eventually the process happens and David does become king. But in the process of becoming king, once he did become king, there was several accomplishments as a king that he had. I mean, he did some great uh, things as a king. We know one, he, he, he beat Goliath. That was uh, a, a Philistine, the Philistine giant. We know that he conquered him. We know that uh, as a chosen leader, he also was established Jerusalem as the capital. Um, and then he brought the ark back uh, to Jerusalem because the ark of God had been taken. And then he also established a unified kingdom. I mean, it's like, man, he, the, Israel had been separated, the north and south, and, and David came and he was able to bring unity to, so it was one nation again. And of course, 
uh, the book of Psalms, he's credited, I told you early, he's, he, he's credited for writing 73 out of the 150 uh, books in the book of Psalms. But here's one that's really important. Because of David's heart, the Bible describes him as being a man after God's own heart. Because of that, God promised that the throne of David would last forever. It would be a dynasty. And I don't know if you know this, but David was born in Bethlehem. Who else was born in Bethlehem? Jesus. Do you know that Jesus came out of the lineage of David? So you fast forward from David's time all the way to Jesus' time, his promise came true because one day we ain't going to have a president no more. We're going to be led by the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. His name is Jesus, right? So there came a time when before David became king that Saul was there, but the time of transition had come because Saul had disappointed God. So in 1 Samuel 13, Verse 14, it says, but now your kingdom must end, Saul, for the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. The Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. So we see this transition is about to happen. Israel was looking for a king, but God was looking for a heart. David was the only one given this name, a man after God's own heart. The only person in all the Bible was given this man after God's own heart. And Saul has already been leading for about 25 years and uh, by the time David even comes into the picture. But it's all about the heart. Everybody say the heart. So here's the question. What is God's measuring stick for leadership? The reason why I ask that is every single person here in this room and watching online, every single person here, you are considered a leader. And let me tell you why. God, Jesus taught us to pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom what? Come, thy will be done, where? On, as it is. How is it gonna be done? Through you and I. So that means every single person here, you have a sphere of influence. People are watching you whether you think they are or not. So you have the ability to lead whether you're young or whether you're old. Sometimes the younger gotta lead the older. But in the kingdom of God, you need to accept your responsibility for being a leader because the heart is what God is looking for. So this is what we know. God's measuring stick for leadership is the heart. God's measuring stick for leadership is the heart. Proverbs 4.23 is so, your heart is so important. It says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. And then in Matthew 5.8, it says, blessed are the pure in heart they will see God. Now, this is a really important thing because if you don't have a healthy heart, remember, everything flows from it. So if you don't have a healthy heart, guess what? You're gonna have unhealthy consequences. You're gonna make unhealthy choices. You're gonna make unhealthy decisions because out of that bankrupt heart of yours, if you are trying to function, think about it this way. Confrontation is not a bad thing unless you have an unhealthy heart. If you are in a confrontation and you got to have the last word, unhealthy heart. If you are in a conversation and you have to prove your point and you have to win and you have to this, you, unhealthy heart. And therefore, what begins to happen is out of the unhealthiness of your heart, you begin to react and respond and you're not acting out of who you were made to be, but you're acting out of the pain that's in your heart. And so you say, how do I deal with my heart? Well, first thing you could do is we've laid it out here at Bayside Community Church and go through the growth track, go through freedom where we can deal with the heart blockages because there's some things that get in our heart that cloud our purpose. It prevents us from becoming all that God wants us to be. And so next thing you know, we don't even know. Our heart is so just crammed with stuff. And Jesus wants to come in and clean out your heart so that you can be free to be who he's made you to be. But with a heart that's unhealthy, man, life gets difficult. All the drama and craziness that we see, you know why it is? Because people got unhealthy hearts. At some point, 
In life, you know, they, they tell you when you get a certain age or whatever, you should go get your physical heart checked. And you always go and they check your blood pressure and they check your, all of your heart beat. Now, you know, when you go to the doctor, they check all of that. Well, how often do we do that with our own heart spiritually? Do we have a checkup to make sure that we can be like David, a man after God's own heart, a woman after God's own heart? When you look at King Saul and you look at King David, you begin to see this comparison between their hearts. Saul's heart, he had a fear of man. David's heart, he had a fear of God. Saul's heart, he was a worrier. David's heart, he was a worshiper. Saul's heart, he was thirsty for man's applause. And David's heart, he was thirsty for God's presence. Saul's heart, he was paranoid. But David's heart, he was peaceful. Saul's heart, he was raging with jealousy. But David's heart, he was full of love. Saul's heart was all about self-preserving, but David's heart was about servant leadership. Check your heart. All of us have motives. And the more unhealthy our heart is, the unhealthy we find that our motives come from that place. If God is saying, guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life, how many issues are you walking in are only because your heart? So, when we begin to look at this story in 1 Samuel chapter 16, it's very interesting. I love this part because now Saul has been, you know, he's been checked. God's like, I'm done with you. So, in verse 1 of chapter 16, it says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, You have, you have mourned enough for Saul. I've rejected him as king of Israel, so fill your flask with oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. But Samuel asked, how can I do that? If Saul hears about me, he will kill me. Take a heifer with you, the Lord replied, and say uh, that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you which of his sons to anoint for me. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. And when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong, they asked. Do you come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. When they arrived, Samuel took one, of, uh, one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. So can you see how society is getting us to look at the outward? We look at the outward and we go, that's the real thing. That's the real thing. That's the real thing. And we get caught up in thinking that's the wrong, the, the real thing, but it's really the wrong thing. It's pleasurable for a moment. Trust me, this cake going to be good in a minute. <laughs> well, we missed the wrong thing. We, 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 get, we end up getting the wrong thing. So look at this, 1 Samuel 16. Just look at verse 10 and 11. It says, in the same way, now all of the sons walk before uh, Jesse. And they're presented to uh, Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Then Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? There's, and then he says, there's, Jesse says, they're still the youngest, but he's out there in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. We won't sit down and eat until he arrives. So then, of course, uh, they go to get David. Now, if you can imagine, David is out there just being faithful, chilling with the sheep, doing his thing. And I imagine at some moment he had to feel left out. Anybody ever felt left out? He's sitting there like, everybody over there meeting the prophet, and I'm out here with the sheep. See, you know, I'm just doing what somebody working, at least somebody working, right? <laughs> he was doing his thing. But I imagine he probably felt left out. But anyways, they go and get him. Can you imagine what the excitement David must have had? They say, hey, the prophet wants to see you. Can you imagine the brother was like, I can't believe he ain't picked me. He's going to pick this dude out here with the sheep. Come on, knucklehead. Come on, see the prophet. That's B's version. 
So then David comes, and I, and I love it because in verse 12 and 13, they give a, this description of David. In verse 12, it says, so Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome, but beautiful. I like that part. I, I can connect with David on that part right there. I just, he was dark and handsome. Can I just read that one more time? He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one. Anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of oil and he brought and anointed David with the oil and the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. And then Samuel returned to Ramah. Now verse 18, this is what's interesting. This is where it shifted because remember Saul needed somebody to ease this torment that he was having. And so one of his servants in verse 18 says this about David, given this description. Now we just saw they, 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 from the outward appearance, said that he was dark and handsome. And then this is what Saul's servant says. One of Jesse's sons from Bethlehem is a talented harp player. So he's a musician. All my single ladies, check this out. This is the kind of man you might want. Not only that, he's a brave warrior, a man of war, and has good judgment. He is also a fine-looking young man, and the Lord is with him. Now, if you haven't made a list, this would probably be a good one if you ladies is the same. But I want you to notice that in this portion of scripture, all of these things about his, I mean, he's a musician and, and he's brave and he's a man of war and he's got good judgment. But the last thing they say is the Lord is with him. You can have it all together at church in front of everybody. And your heart and your life jacked up. Because you're doing it your way. Because you're the king of your heart. Rather than the king being the king of your heart. So the last thing they observe. Even though they saw all of this physical things about him. He's handsome. He's talented. He this or that. The Lord is with him. They saw the heart. How important is the heart? It's very important. So... As we go through this, and I, uh, I just I want to give you a couple of things because David, as he's sitting out there, as I begin to wrap this up, that's my first closing. I got four more. <laughs> I'm about to turn it loose. You love for we, we ain't got number time. Come on, somebody. Anyway, just kidding. <laughs> David is sitting out there. His brothers are sitting before the prophet. They finally come to get him. But do you realize that David must have felt like he did when he was out there writing some of those Psalms all alone? The king is trying to kill him. He's sitting out there feeling unseen, not valued. And here's the thing. Just because you're not visible doesn't mean that you're not valuable. Just because you're not visible, it doesn't mean that you're not valuable. Just because you're not visible to others doesn't mean that you're not visible to God. God sees you. So in that humble season, in that humiliating season of being out, being faithful, doing this one thing where it appears that all your, the people that you're admiring and comparing yourself to are, are doing this and doing that and you want to do this and you want to do that and you're willing to compromise Jesus being the king of your heart so that you can have a moment of satisfaction. I want you to tell you, I want to tell you, it is not worth it. Never underestimate the humiliating seasons of life that you go through. Why? Because what you feel is humiliating is actually God's preparation for an acceleration toward your destiny. Should I say that again? I think I will. What you feel is humiliation is actually God's preparation for an acceleration toward your destiny. Samuel says, we're not going to eat until David shows up. Go get your youngest son. We will wait until he gets here. This is what I wonder. How many opportunities and blessings won't happen or haven't happened until you show up? How often 
Are we so busy trying to please everybody else and be like somebody else that we actually never really show up who we were meant to be? We're, we come to church, but we don't serve the church. We live in a neighborhood, but we don't serve the neighborhood. We have the truth, but we don't give the truth. We have love, but we don't give love. We participate in sin, but don't honor the sacred. So here becomes the question. If I check my heart and I allow God to heal my heart, fix my heart, I could possibly show up. And when I do, I wonder if God's been waiting for us to show up so that we can have that opportunity towards our destiny. So here's four observations that I made because this is what I believe. That if you won't let God lead you, then your leadership will eventually self-destruct. Because remember, you're all leaders. So if you won't let God lead you, your leadership will self-destruct. It's interesting, and if I can, I'm just going to keep meddling while I'm already there. My foot's already in the door, so I'm going to keep meddling. We're looking for a man to lead our nation, to lead this world, to lead whatever And we have all of our opinions about it, but we can't even lead our own heart and our own lives. And we're looking for somebody else to change things when I don't even make the changes that I need to make for me. And if we could just allow the change to happen here, I I may not be able to do much with the big picture, but I can start right here. I can just start right here being faithful in this sphere of influence that God has given me, being faithful to the skills, the talents, the gifting, the truth, the revelation that he's given me. Be faithful and to steward what God has given me in this season with the few people around me or the many people around me. If I'm faithful there, that will make a difference in just one life at a time. And I promise you, we will get to partner with God and earth will look a whole lot better if we all just participate with God. Boy, don't get me started. Four things and I close. Second closing, told you. All right. Four observations. One, David was faithful in the field. He was faithful in the field. He was doing what he was assigned to do. Now, he didn't have social media or any of that, but I guarantee he knew that his brothers were going to see the prophet, but he remained faithful doing what he was called to do. He wasn't looking, trying to, well, I, wonder, I wonder what is happening. I, I want to go over there. I, I, let me, the sheep will be okay. Let me just, no, he didn't do that. He remained faithful in the field. Then the second thing is he was faithful in the familiar. Faithful in the familiar. I, I remember and when I say that, meaning sometimes we get so frustrated because we're doing the same thing over and over and over, you, you know, whatever job you have and you're wanting something else, you're kind of getting bored. And people, when they get bored like that, they stop being faithful in what they were called to because they're trying to get to the next. And then they start slacking on the things that got them to where they were. And when you start to get slack in the things that got you to where you are, you're actually allowing that thing that you're supposed to be catching up to, to get further away from you. So you got to remain faithful with the familiar. I remember Um, before anybody knew who Bernard Scott was, before I got to stand on this incredible platform that Pastor Randy entrusted uh, to me, uh, I I remember I was working on the facilities team at a church. I was vacuuming floors, mopping floors. Back then, it was all brass everywhere, like gaudy gold brass everywhere, and I had to polish it, get all the fingerprints off of it. And then the toilets, in there just cleaning the toilets. Oh, this is so nasty. God, man, it's so nasty. (laughs) That's what I'll be like. I'll be like, Lord, protect me in Jesus' name. Protect me. (laughs) I had plastic everywhere. Just. (laughs) I was doing that. Nobody saw me. Nobody praised me. But people appreciated sitting on clean toilets. People appreciate it having toilet paper in there. In fact, let's give it up for all of our facilities team at all of our locations that serve us so well, man. They keep our buildings looking fantastic. 
But I was faithful in the field. I was faithful with the familiar. I didn't know what was next. I I didn't know what my next season was going to be. But this was an opportunity that I had to take care of the house of God. And I did it faithfully in there, vacuuming and mopping and cleaning toilets and polishing brass. And I did it faithfully on and on without complaining, without murmuring. I did it being faithful with the familiar because I knew what I could do. But I was faithful there. And then here's a, a third thing. David was faithful when forgotten. When they didn't call him the first time, he remained faithful. When you feel forsaken, don't be mistaken. God has not forgot about you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He hasn't forgot about you. And here's the last thing. He was faithful in the future. Now, when I say he was faithful in the future, now remember, David faithful in the field, faithful in the familiar, faithful with the forgotten. He was faithful in the future. Samuel anoints him with oil. And some scholars say that they believe during that ceremony, they know exactly what that is. And David knew at that moment that he was being anointed as king. Some believe that Samuel whispered, you will be the future king of Israel. After that happens, can you imagine if God told you what was next in your life? Some of us would be like, okay, I got this, God. Thank you for letting me know. And you start going after it without waiting for the process and the preparation to get you ready for that next season of your life. But David went from that anointing with oil to going right back out to the sheep. And while he was out there with the sheep, he learned how to protect them. He got that slingshot and he's practicing. I imagine like as a young man, you're practicing on targets or whatever. And then he advanced and started hitting like small game. And then, you know, before he ever killed the lion and the, and the tiger and all that stuff, the bear and all that stuff, he's practicing with that slingshot, not knowing that his future, there would be a giant that that slingshot, that perfection when he was unseen and unknown, his pr- practice in the wilderness and in the waiting would allow him to be ready for his future. He was faithful in the future. You don't know that what you're doing right now is preparing you for your future. So stay faithful in it so that you don't miss what God's bringing to you. Oh, that's good preaching right there. Why is that? For every anointing and appointing, there's a season of process and preparation. For every anointing and appointing, there is a season of process and preparation. Do not despise the season of preparation that you're in now. Be faithful. Be a faithful mom, dad, brother, sibling, manager, employee. Be faithful. Be faithful. You say it's hard. You don't understand how hard it is. Allow God to turn it around for your good, but you have to remain faithful so that you can learn from the season that you're in. And if you do, and this is why I want you to I'm give you all homework. I know you didn't want homework this week, but you all go on and get homework. So take notes. All right, you ready? Take notes. Here's your homework. I want you to ask yourself these questions. Am I being faithful in my season of life? You can take pictures of it. They're going to come on the screen. Am I being faithful in my season of life? Here's the second question. Am I depending on people's perception of my outward success, or am I concerned about a healthy heart? Am I depending on people's perception of my outward success or am I concerned about a healthy heart? And here's the last question. Am I settling for a counterfeit because I can't wait for the real? Am I settling for a counterfeit because I can't wait for what's real? Now, I want you to process those questions this week. Why? Because I believe the Spirit of God will help reveal the areas of your heart that maybe you have not surrendered to him and you can better be prepared for what he has ahead of you. God wants you to have a whole heart and that requires surrender, humility to say, God, I need you. Jesus offered himself so that you can have a relationship. It first starts there. Salvation. He paid for the penalty of your sin. We're all imperfect. But because of the sacrifice Jesus made, he makes us holy so that when God sees you, he sees you through the blood of Christ. And all I have to do is surrender my heart and allow him to sit on the throne of my heart. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to extend this invitation. If you today have not allowed Jesus to be the Lord of your life, to be your savior, you want him to sit on the throne of your heart on the count of three, I want you to lift your hand boldly. One, two, three. 
three, unashamedly lift your hand. You say, yes, I want to surrender my heart to him. I want to receive him as my Lord and my Savior. That's it. Hold it high. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you can put your hands down. We're all going to say a simple prayer. And this simple prayer is just an affirmation of what's already taken place in your heart. Say these words with me. Father God, I believe that Jesus died for me, that he rose again. So I make a choice to say yes. I surrender to your will and to your way. Come into my life. Be my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name.